Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me here in the cloud, the cloud Village. And let's begin. So about me, though, everybody, my name is Felipe Esposito, and I'm also known as Proteus. I'm a security researcher from TNT Security. Uh, it's a startup focused on cloud security. Uh, that is my handle in Twitter and my email address from described below. And I'm from the beautiful and dangerous city of the Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. So my motivation for this talk, uh, every other day we have some data leak, mostly because of some S3 buckets were misconfigured or anything related like that. But there's nothing wrong with S3 buckets getting that much of attention. They are probably the most prevalent and easy to find misconfigured AWS resource uh on the internet and it stores a lot of data so yeah and gray hat warfare is my witness there are at least uh, three nine four thousand public s3 buckets holding more than six billions of documents and that's a huge amount of documents right yeah but uh, aws has uh other services too and some of those sources, services can also be misconfigured and exposed to the internet as well. And today we are going to talk about six of them. But uh, first, uh, in 2020, Scott Piper published a list of uh, AWS exposable resources on GitHub. And this list has a lot, 20 or more uh, exposable resources and that can be exposed to the public or to another AWS account. Uh, the list is on GitHub. It's pretty easy to find. It's pretty easy to anyone to understand which AWS API you have to reach to or request to expose that resource. And based on that list, we choose some services to understand a little bit better, try to hunt them a little bit better about that service and try to hunt them on the internet. So another pretty interesting project was Endgame from Kinnar McQuaid. He released a new tool early in this year that was capable of backdooring AWS resources by making it public or uh, exposed for another uh, AWS account or an attacker account. And this kind of tools, it's helpful to show us the impact of a backdoored AWS resource that can be, can, that you can have on different environments and it helps blue teams to create detections for that. So uh, cheers for McQuaid for doing that for us. And in 2019, Ben Maurice did a great job by analyzing exposed EBS volumes. EBS volumes are like uh, are hot, black hot drivers when you're attached to a EC2 instance and you store things there, right? And for those EBS volumes, they can be shared with another AWS accounts or make it public on the AWS. So he did a great job by analyzing those public EBSs. Uh, he was able to review some secrets, source codes, and PII stuff. But in order to, to carry, to, to find those EBS, he just had to carry the AWS API for to, to get a list of those resources. So it's what Kind of, kind of easy to find those resources. So he did a great job. He did a great talk. He had some challenge to solve, and he did it pretty well. Uh, so congrats for him. But uh, all those exposed resources and data, they came from uh, somewhere. Uh, I'd like to say sorry first, because as some gymnastics at the Olympics have some obligatory movements. Uh, we do have an obligatory slide to cover before diving to AWS and manage resources. And that is the shared responsibility model. Yeah, unfortunately. Okay, so the shared responsibility model uh, dictates that AWS is responsible for patching, updating, and maintaining the managed and resources. And the customer is responsible for configuring the resource policy, security groups, and for their security their data. So all those data that I found in this research was only possible because customers failed in protecting their own stuff. And 
just some stats. So pretty quickly, I was able to find at least 10, 20 public read uh, SQS queues, 19 public write SQS. I also able to reach more than 690,000 cloud research, cloud search documents, more than uh, at least 30 undisclosed active MEQ, and more than five terabytes of exposed data on Elastic Search itself. And just a little bit quick disclaimer, and it's important to note that I didn't ask any of those data. I just counted the data that I was possible to count without touching it. So I don't want to go to jail, and that's it. So for the data sources, which data sources I choose to try to find to hunting for AWS services? Well, uh, I choose two data sources for passive DNS, RiskIQ, the community one, and Security Trails. Security Trails is 50 bucks, it's not that expensive. So yeah, it's a good source. I have some other OSINT techniques like Wayback Machine, Subdomain Enumeration, and code repository. So for a code repository, one thing that I did, and it was pretty interesting, is to get the SHH Git project. It's a project that uh, is on GitHub, and their objective is, is to, uh, it keeps carrying the, the GitHub API for trying to find some secrets, uh, credentials, passwords that were leaked when a developer commit the code to the GitHub, so I just modified it to find uh, AWS endpoint services. Uh, also, I had the idea to use the Google Cloud Big Carry to search for AWS resources in a public data source. So GCP has a public data source from GitHub and it backs to 2019 and have more than two terabytes of data. So uh, it seems cool to work to checking out. And finally, I wrote uh, some Python scripts to carry the GitHub search API endpoint. And the problem is that uh, the, the API endpoint is only comes back with the first, 10, the first thousand resource results. So I had to play a little bit around to implement some tweaks and orcs to get enough relevant data. But the good side, the advantage of carrying the GitHub is that some resources can be protected by username and password. And sometimes developers uh, make the mistake of committing them with the code they are, they are writing. So it's worth looking into. Sorry. And for subdomain enumerations, uh, I read a really good blog post from Ricardo Irama. He wrote an article uh, doing a comparison of nine subdomain enumeration tools and based on those findings, I picked the following for this research. I choose to use find domain and MS. MS from WASP, it's capable of getting uh, information from several sources like Wayback Machine, DNS dumpsters, and Rapid DNS, for instance. So and we also try to use Shodan in Sciences for a few specific cases. And we show in the results to the results on slides to come but no, that was not that successfully. And by discarding the data sources, uh, I tried to use set string uh, to try to identify some uh, unique URLs, but as we are going to, uh, to, to see that AWS is using wildcard certificates for most of the services, which makes set string of no use in identifying uh, individual host names. But uh, as we are going to perceive during the talk that most of AWS resources has a, a hidden component in the DNS and that must prevent from brute forcing. But the set string, we can see the handle, the handle part on certificates. So we only needed to find the name provided information when you create that resource. But that would be like a brute force and a shot in the dark and brute forcing wasn't in scope for this research. And I didn't try that. I didn't went for that way. Right. So uh, I do have some metrics here. Uh, I call it valid DNS 
when the host name is and when the, I got a first name and it is always for uh, IP address, that means that resource on AWS is still active. And I call it public IP when that IP resolved from the previously URL are not in the RFC 1918 on the private ranges. So, uh, yeah, I choose these two metrics to decide uh, which data source would be a good one. So, the first managed services that I, I, I explored was the Qubit DB. And I know that we can access directly access the Qubit DB from the internet because it's always deployed in a VPC. And that means that we need at least an AC2 instance to inside of that VPC to connect it first and make a tunnel through it to connect to the document DB database. But I was able to find some instance on the census that have a HTTP proxy tunneling the document DB to the internet. Well, people get creative ways to expose their data, right? Yeah. And from document DB and those data sources, for example, uh, what I call historical GitHub, it's the GitHub from the big carry search. And then I got seven unique results. Git root search by carrying the API, I got 117. The security trails came back with 33 results and passive total with just one from risk IQ. But the, the true results are that only 37% of the DNA, the, the, the domains that I found was valid. So 62% of that was old enough or was, this, was not valid at all. And the most percentage of valid DNS came from security trails followed by GitHub carry. So passive total, it's just a little bit. Uh, another service that I tried to uh, explore was the Amazon MEQ. And when you create an Amazon MEQ, by default, you have to, two kinds of MEQs to choose, to, two kinds of queues to choose. You can choose between Rabbit MEQ and Active MEQ. When you create an Active MEQ, by, by default, it's created inside a VPC and it has a security group to protect it. So it's not directly exposed to the internet. Uh, unless uh, the administrator changed the security group to allow 000 inbound. But when you create a rabbit MEQ, on the other hand, it's all exposed directly to the internet. So it's only protected by login and password that you create when you create the rabbit MEQ. Right. So I was able to find more than 4,000 uh, rabbit MEQs in Shodan. And that's pretty straightforward. And for the rest, I was able to find around 1,500 uh, MS find domain, two on historical GitHub, five on GitHub search, and 145 on security trails, and none on passive total. But, well, this is the print screen from, from Shodan. So just, uh, we have 116, 600 only for uh, US East one. And it's pretty straightforward, just clicking on, uh, if you know the username and the, uh, the password, you can just log in and, and see the queue, right? But well, but what about Unikey URLs? Uh, we found around uh, 200, 300 around something Unikey URLs, but the most valid Unikey URLs came from MS and five domain. If we check two slides before, uh, MSFI domain has 50, 563 unique URLs and security trails has 145. But when we get, when you check for valid URLs, security trails is almost close to MSFI domain. So, yeah. And, and you remember that when I said active MEQ that you have to change the security group to allow 000 inbound? Yeah, we found at least 30 cases where the admins did just that. So I was able to access the console of the uh, active MEQ by just uh, doing a HTTP get on the URL and the port to H1 meet 62. Yeah, well, another uh, managed service that I tried to, to explore was Amazon Cloud Search. And Amazon implements uh, an elastic load balance in front of the cloud search. 
So, and one interesting thing to note that uh, the cloud search, you, know, you have to choose a name, then came the random uh, string, the region cloud search in Amazon AWS on the URL. So looking for that in Shodan, I could reach at least 38,000 uh, cloud search servers on the internet. But in Shodan, you, don't, you only have the IP address. So as Amazon implements uh, Elastic Load Balance in front of it, without knowing the DNS, we are not able to, to get the correctly virtual host, uh, which leads us to only amass GitHub and passive DNS as data sources. And for those data sources, I tried to check if DNS was valid and, and try to do an unauthenticated research for letters E or A. Because I, I chose those letters because they're really common in almost all languages. And if the, res the resource policy of the cloud search was set to star, I would be able to carry those, those letters, right? So yeah, uh, just checking by valid DNS, I found that security trails was the most privileged with more than 30. A mass fine domain around 10 and passive DNS if only two uh, valid DNS. But on those 42 valid DNS that I found, I was able to reach at least 609,000 documents. So it's a, a huge amount of data, right? Well, and another service that I tried to, expo to explore was Amazon SQS. And Amazon SQS are exposed by a uh, URL. So it's kind of tricky because if you have a URL, uh, all the SQS region.amazonaws.com are valid. They resolve for API address, but the queue must exist, might exist here or not. So that completely, uh, makes uh, passive URL in subdomain enumeration techniques completely ineffective. So we only had historical GitHub and GitHub search to try to hunt in for Amazon SQS. And by doing this research, I just found that uh, more than 450 uh, URLs from GitHub historical was not public, so I couldn't read or write, but I found that at least the training was public readable. And at least 19, 19 of that uh, SQS was readable and writable. This interesting part of the public readable is that you can intercept the messages from their pipeline and perhaps get some important piece of information. And for those who are publicly writable, uh, it can lead for more serious vulnerabilities like SSRF or any remote code execution by just depending which part of the code will consume the messages from the queue. For instance, if we have a Lambda with some kind of vulnerability and we will be able to write anything that we want, unexpected to that Lambda would be might exploitable. And the other services that I, I, I tried to reach was Amazon Redshift. And Amazon Redshift, uh, it's like a, a, a post grid database, like a cluster of a data warehouse. And also uh, Amazon exposed Redshift through DNS entries. So every time Amazon exposes something as DNS entries, it's like a one to one for DNS in IP address. When it's by Elastic load balance, you might have two IP address or more for that entry. So it's kind of easier to find uh, Amazon Redshift. So to publicly expose a Redshift database to the internet, you must one, create an Elastic AP address and then configuring the Redshift to use the Elastic AP address to, the, uh, to use that Elastic AP address you created before. And then you have to change the security group to allow 0000 inbound. For Redshift, uh, Amaz and Find Domain was able to find only 42 results. Historical GitHub only seven, GitHub search around 192, and security trails 226. Passive total only two. But 
checking by if they are valid or not on the on Unix DNS. Most of the parts of security trails were valid. Uh, that is an IP address that resolved to that uh, DNS. And for GitHub care, it's less than MS5 domain. So MS5 domain was able to find that 19% of valid DNS by source instead of uh, GitHub carry, right? And one interesting thing to note is that uh, sorry. Uh, interesting thing to note is that I couldn't find any uh, Amazon Redshift public exposed to the internet. So can I hear an hallelujah? Yep. It's at least one good thing. So, and the last service that I tried to, to find and trying to explore was AWS Manager Elasticsearch. And when you create an Elasticsearch, uh, you have to choose if you want to create it public or inside a VPC. When you create it inside a VPC, you get the following host name. You get a VPC dash name dash random string that dot region dot AES dot Amazon dot com. And when you create a public one, which means that they're reachable from the internet, uh, you have the host name like search slash name random region yes Amazon WS dot com. And uh, Elasticsearch is also exposed through uh, Elastic Load Balancing. So we need to know the name, the exactly name from the host to, to get the, the exactly V host. And for Elasticsearch, you can also choose uh, uh, the type of authentication. So you can choose between uh, Cognito, Basic Auth from HTTP, yeah, AIM, none, and a little bit more, a little more uh, open distro has another configuration that's a bit more specific. Well, but looking for our public Elasticsearch, Scott Piper published it on a, on a forward cloud sec uh, Slack group that he was able to find at one year ago, 387 public AWS managed elastic searches. And the last time he reported in February, he were able to find 359. He advised to, to AWS to close those pu public reachable AWS managed services. And I tried to reproduce his, his search and I'm only able to find five. So yeah, AWS made a really good job closing those publicly uh, managed elastic searches. But what I believe they what they did is was to put a load balance in front of them. So we couldn't be able to reach them directly by IP address. Well, some stats for managed elastic search. From, by looking for valid DNS per source, uh, security trails was able to find more than a thousand valid, valid DNS, followed by passive total, MS, domain, GitHub carry, GitHub historical was way down. But the percentage of valid, valid DNS that I found was only 41%. So 41% of the, all the, the hosts that I found was valid. Right. Well, and those and those who are, who are valid, and I tried to to get some information. I was able to determine that uh, more than eight hundred was the IIM authentication type. Uh, a little bit more than a hundred was open to the internet, and some a little bit less than a hundred has basic authentication. And for those who which were open. I counted uh, uh, 11,000 number of indexes and at least 5.1 terabytes of data that was exposable to the internet as well. And when we try to understand which data sources are public by source, we found that security trails were, has 58% of the publicly open Elasticsearch managers. Uh, but when we try to, to Compare that with the amount of, of data that was exposable, exposable MS with find domain has more than 40% of that. So 
if you're trying to look for exposed data, uh, a massified domain is a little bit more uh, better than security trails in that case. So, yeah. So some closing thoughts. Well, take the shared responsibility model seriously, and please uh, do it well. Make sure you're not exposing uh, any of your, your data. Find EAM resource policies that allow principal, star, or equivalent. And for this, you can use some uh, security tools to automatically detect and mitigate those kind of misconfigurations. For instance, uh, CSPM, uh, Security Hub, or Security Hub, or AWS config rules. And due to the dynamic nature of the clouds, historical GitHub uh, make data was obsolete. So. Uh, as the data stops in 2019, most of the services who were created and destroyed by then uh, were not on valid anymore. So we spent around $250 in big carry searches for almost no valid hits. So yeah, sorry boss. Well, and passive DNS has a partial visibility of the cloud infrastructure, but it's still a good source for hunting for AWS managed resources. So, yeah, that's all that I have for today, guys. Uh, do I have time for questions?